I'm Bob Short. This is Reflection on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Duckworth Library at Young Harris College and the Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're here at Manuel's Tavern, an Atlanta gathering place for political and other misguided souls. <laughs> Our guest tonight is Tom Houck, well-known civil rights activist, advisor to numerous political figures, radio talk show host, and a man about the town in Atlanta. Welcome, Tom. Well, it's quite an honor to be with you, uh, Bob Short, and uh, a shout out here to uh, Kathy Cox up there at, uh, at uh, Young Harris. Good. From Boston to Jacksonville to Atlanta, tell us about your early life and how and why you came here. Well, I guess you could say on August 21st, 1947, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in a public hospital, an instigator, provocateur, was born. <laughs> and that man was me. Uh, they called me Buster in the hospital because I was, you know, I was crying and yelling and screaming from the moment I came out of my mother's room. And I went on to uh, uh, become, I lived in, 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 in Somerville, which was actually a poor section of Boston. Uh, and just outside of Cambridge for the first six years of my life. Very working class Irish and Italian neighborhood. I come from Irish German parentage and uh, my father was a, uh, a machinist when he could find work. Uh, most of the time he was on employment. My mother was a waitress at Howard Johnson restaurant uh, and several Howard Johnson restaurants. They got all the money together they finally moved out of the suburbs to Framingham outside of Boston where I uh, started to develop some of my own social consciousness. My second grade teacher was a black woman. And in those days, this was back in 1953, segregation in public schools in most places in the country, not so much in the Northeast, although it was de facto, uh, was uh, mandated by law. It wasn't until the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 that changed that. So I was very fortunate as a young fellow to have a, a African-American teacher who Miss Thompson sort of became my guidance if you will to where I would go down the road and I, and I television was just becoming a, a major thing back in those days not really a major thing if you had a television the whole neighborhood would be down the street watching it at your house and we had a TV so I, I, gravi my, I sort of my move towards gravitation towards the news started to watch the news and I, I started to see what was happening in terms of the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. And I asked my second grade teacher about this. And uh, she told me that in many sections of the country, colored and Negro st students couldn't go to school with white students. Well, I just couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand why that was. Here I am as eight or nine years old. So then at that moment, I would say, if you would say this is a defining moment why I became involved in the civil rights movement and why in many ways I came to Atlanta, Georgia, which was in, in, in later in my life, was because of what happened in 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision and television. All of those kind of things mixed together. And when I was 12 years old, I, I was in Cambridge uh, visiting a friend and, and his uncle was a Unitarian minister and said he was going over to Woolworths to picket uh, a Woolworths uh, to give support, and this is 1960, for the uh, students uh, in uh, Greensboro, um, North Carolina, who were uh, getting arrested for sitting in at lunch counters. And, and so that was my first actual time carrying a sign, a picket sign, when I was 12 years old outside a Woolworth store in Central Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts. When did you meet Dr. Martin Luther King? Well, I met Dr. King actually, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't remember this, but I actually met him in Selma in 1965. Uh, I had been going to high school and named uh, for the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, uh, and I was in Jacksonville, Florida, living with an aunt. Uh, I caused quite a stir at that high school, but you asked me how I met Dr. King, so I, I, what I did was, I, me and a couple of other students from Nathan Bedford Forrest, which was an all-white high school, school still segregated in Jacksonville, went to Selma the week after Bloody Sunday when our good friend, uh, now Congressman John Lewis and Hosea Williams led the march across and were uh, brutally attacked with uh, horses and dogs and billy clubs and, uh, and a great deal of violence by the Alabama State Troopers. That was in March of 1965. 
Uh, I actually went uh, into a, a meeting of SCLC staff, which was right down the street from uh, the church in Selma, where everybody was congregating for the big march uh, to uh, Selma Montgomery March. And I actually met Dr. King that day. It wasn't until about a year later that I actually uh, uh, became part of SCLC staff. And actually, my boss was Jose Lorenzo Williams. Uh, he was the uh, uh, field director for SCLC, and I went to work for SCLC. And so I would, I, it was Sue Jose that I really met Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about SCLC. Well, SCLC was started uh, out of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956, uh, and 55 and 56. And it was started by Ralph David Abernathy, uh, Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry, and by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, along with a number of other people in the Montgomery Improvement Association, mm -hmm. which was uh, the organization in Montgomery that basically uh, uh, organized uh, the demonstrations in the successful year-long boycott of the Montgomery buses, uh, led by uh, the arrest of uh, Rosa Parks. So what happened was there was a number of churches across the South. There only, the, the one thing that the, the, the authorities uh, and, and, the, and the government couldn't do in, in, in the South uh, was to uh, stop black churches. Black churches was the, were the places where folks could go, where folks could sing, where folks could pray, where folks could organize where folks can get out there and, uh, and, and do the job of trying to right the wrongs of the past couple of hundred years. So there were preachers all across the South, uh, and uh, they, they started this organization based in Montgomery, which Dr. King, by the way, had gone to Montgomery, funny enough, because he didn't want to be in his father's shadows in Atlanta. So in Montgomery, found himself what they would call there a high yellow church, uh, which would be a church that was sort of made up of male men and male women, mostly male women, men in those days, black male men and male, male women, rail porters, uh, uh, the higher uh, echelon economic groups, some doctors and teachers, and he went to Dexter Avenue over there, and that's when he was not interested in getting in the movement, by the way. Dr. King just wanted basically to uh, get on his own and preach on his own and not be under his father's shadows in Atlanta. So when he went to Montgomery, he had no idea that he was going to be leading a bus boycott within a year. And neither did the people in his church. Uh, because, as I said, this was a middle-income church, a stone's throw from the cradle of the Confederacy over there, uh, the Capitol uh, on Dexter Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama. But what Dr. King did uh, was, when he became that leader, when he became that voice, we're talking about a man of 25 years old. He was 25 years old when he led that Montgomery bus boycott and became, went on the national scene. Well, in 1957, uh, the year after the Montgomery bus boycott ended, uh, 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 ended and was successful, uh, the organization was created and it was sought by most of the preachers that rather than having Montgomery as the headquarters, that the logical place would be Atlanta. So two years after Dr. King began pastoring at Dexter, he moved to uh, uh, Atlanta and, and, and set up headquarters here on Auburn Avenue, uh, right down the street from his father's church, and became associate pastor. He was never pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. Daddy King would let people know that as well. He was always the associate pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. He was born on Auburn Avenue. He was born on Auburn Avenue, and he came back and led the head, put the headquarters of SCLC at Auburn Avenue, was the associate pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church on, uh, on Auburn Avenue. And uh, his funeral uh, was at Ebenezer Baptist Church and, and, and 150,000 people on April 9th, uh, 1968, marched down Auburn Avenue. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, your association with him when you were a chauffeur. Well, let me tell you about that, how that happened. I was, I was actually over working under Jose's, uh, I was working in the field department of SCLC, and we were over in... Um, Grenada, Mississippi, and we were doing a peaceful demonstration, September of 1966, and it was uh, a, a, a support march to desegregating a high school there, and Dr. King and SCLC, which didn't have a lot of high presence in Mississippi, that was pretty much SNCC and other civil rights organizations, SCLC's strengths were Georgia, Alabama, uh, and um, um, other parts of the South, but Mississippi was very strong with SNCC, but we went over there. So about 20 SCLC staff people 
are sitting around and Dr. King's talking about the fact that he had a lot of mail that he had to answer in Atlanta. He had a lot of mail that, uh, you know, that he was not getting answered and he needed some volunteers. So I raised my hand in the, in the staff meeting and I said, Dr. King, I said, I can help answer mail. He said, Tom, you haven't even finished high school. And I said, well, that, I didn't finish high school because I got kicked out of high school. I, when I went to Selma, they suspended me for two weeks. They wanted to give me my diploma and I refused it as a badge of honor. Uh, and so Dr. King said, now what can you write? I said, well, I was a sports editor of my high school newspaper. And he said, well, he said, you, can you really answer mail? I said, I can. And so Dr. King looks at Bernard Lee, who was one of his assistants at that point. And, Hosea wasn't in the room. Thank goodness. Had Hosea been in the room that day, I probably never would have been Dr. King's driver because uh, he would have refused to let me go. But Hosea, I think, had already left, so he wasn't there. So Martin said, uh, well, you want to wait for a couple days and ride back? Or he said, you want to take a bus um, and we'll get you a bus ticket to go back to come to Atlanta. I said, well, I'd love to take a bus because I've never been through Memphis and I understand the bus has to go from here to Memphis to get to Atlanta. And I wanted to go see what Memphis looked like. So I got back to Atlanta in, uh, and I got back there on a Sunday morning, probably around 10 o'clock, and I went down to the SCLC headquarters, which was right down the street from Ebenezer, and there was no one there. And in those days, there were no cell phones. There were no iPhones. There were, I mean, you had to go to the, you know, to the phone across the street at the VFW, put a nickel in and uh, make a phone call, which I did to the Freedom House where I was going to stay. And they said, someone was going to come get you. Well, it went on for an hour and a half. No one came to get me. And uh, finally, Dr. King had finished his sermon down the street at Ebenezer, which I should have gone down to, but I didn't. And he, he drives up in front of Ebenezer and he says, Tom, he says, uh, nobody's picked you up from the Freedom House yet. He said, no. He said, why don't you come have lunch with us? Lord have mercy. <laughs> I mean, have lunch at the King household? I mean, I mean, it was incredible. And so, uh, as chance be, I went to have lunch at the household, and the kids were in the car with me, and Dr. King had to go to a meeting, and Coretta started talking to me about Boston and my passes and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And what happened was uh, she asked me if I had my driver's license. I said, yeah. And I said, why are you asking that question? She said, well, she's had trouble with her drivers, and she said, uh, why don't you think about taking the kids? I said, I don't really know nothing about Atlanta, but... I was probably GPS to, you know, uh, GTS before that happened. I knew how to get places very quickly and go to map. So Coretta asked me if I would take the kids to school the next day. And I said, I'd be delighted to, you know, I'm mean, going mean, to check in with Jose, see what he has to say since he was my official boss. And she said, don't worry about it, I'll have Martin call him. Uh, and so I wound up driving the kids to school the next day. And then for a couple of weeks went back and forth driving the kids to school, helping to answer mail. And then Dr. King um, asked me if I would come on the road with him on, on times and, and, and you know, when, I, when he was traveling. And, but always in Atlanta, my job was basically to take uh, the kids around and take Dr. King to the airport wherever he had to be when he was back in town. Mm -hmm. I'll shut this off. Well, my wife, Diana, wanted me to ask you what you had for lunch. <laughs> Who asked that question? <laughs> my wife, Diana. Why did she ask that question? She was curious. Um, what did I have for lunch? I had a grilled cheese sandwich. Well, then I guess that answers her next question, which was, was Mrs. Bond, or Mrs. Bond was Mrs. King a good cook? Yes. Um, let me bring you into the household, if I can, give you an intimate side of this, by the way. I'm still in the process of putting together my memoir, Driving Dr. King, Looking at History in My Rearview Mirror. Dr. King actually had about four, Dr. King and Coretta King actually had four or five people on staff that worked for them. Dr. King had a meager income. He could have chosen to live in those days, uh, the Beverly Hills of the black community in Atlanta, Collier Heights. Uh, and where his daddy lived and a number of other prominent blacks lived, but he chose to live in Vine City. So when he moved from what became the Freedom House, which unfortunately was torn down on Johnson Avenue, he moved over to, um, he moved over to the, uh, really, uh, the ghetto, uh, Vine, uh, in Vine City in Atlanta. Uh, and everybody was saying, no, no, no. You know, Dr. King needs to have a better house, and he said he didn't need a big house. He didn't need to have all the trapments of a big house, and neither did Coretta. He had a very basic brick bungalow on, on, on uh, Sunset Avenue in Atlanta where Coretta lived 
until the year before her death, just a few years back. Uh, and so she had a staff of like four people. Uh, she had, uh, when I say a staff, uh, Mrs. Lockhart was their cook and housekeeper. And, but Coretta would cook more often than, than she would. Now there's one thing that Coretta wouldn't cook. She wouldn't cook chitlins. Uh, and Dr. King loved chitlins. But one of his favorite and best friends was Juanita Abernathy, Ralph Abernathy's wife, who was an expert chitlin cooker. <laughs> so I would, my first smell of chitlins was at Juanita Abernathy, Ralph Abernathy's house. But yes, Coretta was a good cook. Good. Before we get too far along, let me ask you about, and let's talk about Hosea Williams. Well, I don't think there's anybody like him, Little David. Uh, he is, uh, he was uh, uh, a man that served his country, came back from serving his country and was beaten down in Atapocas, Georgia, at a water fountain. Uh, and it was from that moment on that he decided that he was never going to be beaten by anybody again in life, that he was going to be a crusader. He moved on to Savannah and got involved in the civil rights movement in Savannah taught at Morris Brown College for a while, was a chemist, and he was field director of SCLC. Uh, he was not necessarily a, a devotee to uh, uh, nonviolence uh, in, in the sense of what nonviolence was. Uh, he was a character bigger than life, a hell of an organizer. Hosea was what Martin used to refer to as his kamikazes. Uh, wasn't afraid of nobody, no one, nowhere. And he liked a little taste every once in a while. It was noted for his uh, 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 driving a car while uh, under, uh, under the influence, to put it nicely. But Hosea probably uh, is uh, an underrated in a sense. There's now a statue on the other side of the Alabama River in Selma that commemorates the march with he and John Lewis. Uh, but and John's a very good friend of mine. But Hosea, I think, uh, in, in many ways, was underrated in terms of his leadership in the civil rights movement and what he did. He he, he brought four or five hundred students down here in 1966 that helped really changed uh, you know, in terms of voting rights and all across the South. Hosea was uh, tenacious in his ability to organize and keep a good staff going and keep on going strong. And uh, he was the leader. If there's such a, such a thing in the civil rights movement in the 60s, he was the leader of the foot soldiers of the civil rights movement. He was the sergeant out there, Bob. Mm -hmm. Well, back to Dr. King. What did you and Dr. King talk about while you were driving? Oh, all kinds of things. You know, I mean, you know, those days you didn't have telephones in the car. You didn't have a cell phone. So, I mean, he was, I was like, he was trapped. I was trapped. How the way you want to look at it, you know, in, in terms of talking. So we talk about it from everything from music to what was happening in the organization and there was other people in the car. I'm not a 19-year-old kid now. I'm a 19-year-old kid driving around. At this point, the leader of the March on Washington had already won the Nobel Peace Prize, had led major movements in Selma and also Montgomery and, and, and had been, uh, you know, has, was seen all over the world as a, as a man of the millennium. And, and here I am driving him around in one of two cars. He had a Pontiac, Pontiac Bonneville and he had a blue Bel Air Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes he'd drive me, I would just have the car and he'd just he'd take me out to the airport. And uh, it was the old Atlanta airport. In those days you didn't go through a lot of security. There was no security actually. I mean, just walked right into the airport. Uh, and so we, we, we would talk about music, we would talk about, uh, you know, what was coming up. And he, Dr. King didn't have, by the way, but today everybody would have an entourage around them or they'd have a security guard, they'd have, you know, uh, uh, people with little air pieces in their ear. Dr. King didn't have any of that entrapments, he had me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it was, a, it was always a uh, interesting aspect to hear him talk about politics and where politics would be. I don't think that King lived that he would have uh, uh, followed the path of a Jesse Jackson to run for president or, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or a um, Andy Young and run for Congress. Mm -hmm. I think Martin would never have run for public office. Mm -hmm. But he did say, and it was interesting to hear this just recently, in a BBC interview back in the 1960s, Dr. King said that he fully expected 
that an African American would be elected president, uh, if not in his lifetime, but shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, within, they asked him within 40 years, and he said maybe less, mm -hmm. uh, which was very prophetic in a sense of where he thought this would be, where this country would be today. Mm -hmm. uh, and he would talk about the, the opportunities that he saw coming. But he also saw uh, a, the economic uh, uh, hardship uh, as being much more difficult to break down in terms of the poor in this country uh, than uh, the color barrier. And he said he thought that that would last way beyond, way beyond uh, that century, which was the last century and into the new and 21st century. What was his uh, opinion of the massive resistance to desegregation uh, among the politicians in the South? Well, you know, interestingly enough, the way you put it, okay, uh, Lyndon Johnson had said, I think, to Richard Russell uh, that uh, when he signed the Voting Rights Act, uh, he said he lost the white vote. Democrats had lost the white folks for the next century or half century. Uh, and Martin saw it the same way. Uh, he, he realized that there had to be a new breed of white politicians. There was already a number of whites across the South who had conscience and and, and, and had, had been involved in the civil rights movement. Many of them had to leave the towns and cities they were in, like Charles Morgan Jr. had to leave Birmingham after uh, praising Dr. King after, on, on his Birmingham um, jail speech, a jail, uh, jail letter. But uh, Dr. King, I, I think, saw that there would be a new breed of, uh, of white leadership that would rise up uh, in what you call the 11 southern states of the old Confederacy. And uh, I, I think he saw that there would be a day uh, when there would be more Ivan Allens. Uh, and Ivan Allen was already around in 1964 when he testified. And, would be, and there would be more Charles Weltners here in Atlanta. Uh, there was a, a number of white politicians that stood out uh, in terms of where, um, in his time, where the South was headed. And he saw more Ivan Allens and, and Charles Weltners coming along. Mm -hmm. Did he have any hobbies? Yeah, swimming. <laughs> I mean, he, he was a great swimmer, uh, which he had in common with Andy Young. Mm -hmm. uh, softball, he loved playing softball. Uh, he used to love uh, uh, the bug. Uh, for those who don't know what the bug is, that's the lottery. <laughs> uh, and we used to go to a guy, a little shop down at Auburn Avenue here. Oh my God, one of the biggest lotto guys in the South, or with bug men in the South, a guy named Charles Cato, God bless his soul. Uh, who used to run a little operation on the corner of Auburn Avenue in Piedmont. Dr. King would go in there and, you know, play the numbers. Uh, Did he ever win? Uh, occasionally he'd win. Occasionally he'd win. Uh, but uh, it was something that he would occasionally. He also loved to travel Was a fun, uh, and a, a reader. I mean, he'd bring 10 books with him uh, when he was on the road. I mean, he would just go through, you know, read, read, read. And he was also quite a historian besides being a biblical scholar. Well, you drove the King children to school. Were they enrolled in public schools? Mm -hmm. When I was driving, and they were, uh, Yolanda uh, went to school at Spring Street Elementary School, which is now the Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, then she went on to go to Grady High School. Interestingly enough, one of the children that uh, would drive in the car with us, two of the children that would drive in the car that I'd pick up and drive in school with, one was Maria Saporta, who went on to become a columnist here in Atlanta uh, and uh, for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, and another was Eric Roberts, whose sister uh, is now the famous actress uh, uh, out in California, Julia Roberts. Mm -hmm. And the Robertses, their family, uh, had a theater workshop here for kids, children's workshop, and Yolanda went to the theater workshop uh, with, with Julia's parents, and I was there uh, at the workshop uh, when uh, Julia's mother was pregnant with her. <laughs> Is that right? You're going to tell us your age in a minute if you aren't careful. <laughs> Did the uh, King children ever talk about racial segregation? Not really. I mean, not in those days they didn't. Of course, since then, you know, but uh, Daddy King used to worry quite a bit, by the way, talking about Coretta wanted to know how safe it was. We're talking about 1966, me driving, the white guy driving four black kids around Atlanta. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, obviously they knew 
uh, that you know, I mean, and, and, and went through the process of, the, of their father and mother in the movement. Coretta, by the way, was very much a part of the civil rights movement, but um, why they couldn't, you know, get their shoes uh, fit in the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, shoe store as as uh, as the white kids, and why they had to go to a segregated water fountain, all those kind. Those things happen, but Coretta, Coretta and Martin made sure that their children had everything that uh, the white kids had and, and made sure that their household uh, was uh, integrated at all times, and it was. Mm -hmm. How much was she involved in his civil rights activities? Coretta was involved every day. Uh, I, mean, I mean, Coretta was uh, an unpaid first lady of the civil rights movement, uh, she, and she did a lot of freedom concerts around the country. She was a singer, she's an, uh, she's an opera singer by training. And uh, so she would do these freedom concerts around the country that would raise quite a amount of money, great, great, great amounts of money for SCLC. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she would be a, it was a tenacious fundraiser for the, for the, for the movement. And uh, um, she didn't want to leave the kids very often. So, uh, and by the way, Dr. King and Coretta both took the kids on what they would consider to be safe demonstrations and marches uh, uh, around, of course, in those days, what was safe, but I mean, what they could but be safe. Uh, and so the kids travel with them extensively as well. Mm -hmm. And you would see photos of them. For example, when the Montgomery Selma March reached the Capitol in Montgomery in 1965, uh, uh, the kids participated in that there. march. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's well known that Dr. King fashioned his nonviolent approach uh, on Mahatma Gandhi and his teachings. Did he ever meet? Mahatma he did. He was in India. Uh, he and Coretta went to India. As a matter of fact, Congressman Lewis and Ambassador Andrew Young just came back from a trip to India last year that retraced the, the steps of Dr. King uh, and Mrs. King. In the late 50s, uh, the Kings went to India and spent three weeks. And uh, Martin King III went over there as well uh, with them. But uh, uh, and the influences of Gandhi in the household uh, were, were tremendous. Uh, I mean, Gandhi, with photos of Gandhi around, there were statues of Gandhi around, there was writings of Gandhi around, and of course a great deal of history of Gandhi's relationship to South Africa was, uh, was uh, around. And uh, so, I mean, it, Dr. King was a, a, a Gandhian uh, philosopher, mm -hmm. and bringing together Christianity with that nonviolence. Mm -hmm. uh, his nonviolent approach was not always uh, supported by many civil rights activists particularly among younger, younger ones uh, and black power activists. What Do, do you think Dr. about that? Dr. King, Dr. King knew that he couldn't sell his philosophy to everybody uh, or that other people would buy into uh, nonviolence as being the only method in which uh, uh, social justice would, 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 would take place. For example, he was great friends with Malcolm X. Uh, and Malcolm X, a lot of people would say, would be a black separatist. He was friends with Stokely Carmichael, who really echoed the cry of black power. Right. Uh, he was uh, friends across the board with people who didn't have his own philosophy. He would hope that people would choose to come under the banner of nonviolence in SCLC. But it was in Memphis, 1968. Dr. King, uh, before you could march in Dr. King's marches or demonstrations that he led or SCLC led, you had to go to nonviolent workshops. Mm -hmm. So that would, right then and there, take out a lot of people from participating in it because they could say, well, I'm not going to turn the other cheek, you know, if somebody hits me, I'm going to hit them back. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a hard thing to do is to, you know, is to go in there and not have that happen. But in 1968 in, in, uh, in Memphis, one of the few demonstrations uh, that Dr. King actually led turned into violence in the streets, and that's what uh, caused Dr. King to go back in there to want to put together another demonstration to prove that nonviolence could work. As we were organizing the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, which was going to be the largest nonviolent demonstration and in, 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 in live in, in 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 the nation's history to build tents in Resurrection City, but. One of the worst demonstrations, I don't talk not just about the South, but one of the worst demonstrations that Dr. King ever faced in his life was an open housing demonstration in Chicago. There was a great deal of resentment and, and hate and hostility in 1966 when King went to Chicago. Uh, then 
the late Richard J. Daley, uh, mayor of Chicago, didn't take to having uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, bring his nonviolent uh, end the slums and, and open housing demonstrations to his city, and it was his city. And so it caused a great deal of problems with the, uh, with the, not only the, I think it's one of the few battles that King actually lost was in Chicago in 1966, and probably the most violent demonstration he ever faced was uh, going to try an open housing demonstration in Gage Park in Chicago in 66, when he actually got hit by a rock. You were on the march to Washington, weren't you? I wasn't on 1963, I wasn't on. I was, I was living in Cambridge, Maryland then, uh, still involved with the civil rights movement. I just moved to Cambridge, from Cambridge, Maryland, to Jacksonville, Florida with my aunt. But no, I, I, I wanted to be there. I was, uh, I was 14, 15 years old at the time. But I, shortly thereafter, after, my legs got to moving in marches. <laughs> With Hosea. With Hosea. What was the experience? I met Hosea, by the way, in St. Augustine when I was still in high school. He was in, in St. Augustine 1964, and, uh, which was trying to get public accommodations integrated. And, and that was in 1964 when I met Hosea. J.T. Johnson, a number of other uh, civil rights figures that were down there, Dorothy Cotton, known people from SCLC. That was my first real association with, with SCLC. I was in Jacksonville, Florida, where there was really no SCLC chapter, but an NAACP chapter, and that's where I would bring all these white kids every Wednesday night to the NAACP youth meetings, and from this white high school, Nathan Bedford Forest. How did uh, Dr. King, I might have asked you this, uh, how did he react to to these uh, Georgia governors and senators who uh, used him as an issue in their political campaigns. Well, you know, the, the politician in the King family was Daddy King. Daddy King was the politician in the family. Dr. King didn't really participate in politics, although in 1960, uh, it was his jailing here in Georgia down in Albany right. uh, that uh, probably changed the course of election for John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And Daddy King broke with a number of other black leaders here who were supporting Richard Nixon because in Georgia you had essentially a Democratic Party, as you well know, uh, that was all white. And the Republicans allowed black folks to participate. So most blacks in the South, uh, and particularly in Georgia and Atlanta, who were registered to vote, were Republicans. But Daddy King split in 1960 with Williams Holmes Borders, who was another famous black preacher here in Atlanta whose granddaughter is running for mayor of Atlanta. Borders went with Nixon. And King always used to say, Daddy King used to say, the Borders are always Republican. They're always going to be Republican. They're going to be Republican no matter what. Uh, and Daddy King went for uh, John Kennedy. And that reverberated around the country and probably changed enough votes among black folks in other parts of the country from Nixon to Kennedy to change the election. But King, Daddy King got along with Georgia governors. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd go up there and he'd meet with the Georgia. I mean, he realized that it was segregation and that a lot of that wasn't going to change. But getting certain things done, uh, I think, is the way he looked at it. And I think that uh, in, the, in the latter part of the 60s, King died in 68 now, as you well, as you well recall, uh, things began to change rather dramatically. Uh, I think that... Uh, the entire civil rights movement was in distress when Lester Mannix was elected governor. Uh, I mean, this is a man that came out and shooed people who went to close his restaurant down rather than serve black folks and with, with an axe handle uh, in his own Pickwick restaurant. So I think that, and in later years, I mean, after, when I was doing talk radio, of course, I got to know Lester a little bit better. You know, always call me Mr. Tom, by the way, <laughs> Lester. Uh, I mean, I, so I got to get to know, I got to know him a lot better over the years. and. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that he regretted a lot of what, what people saw towards him as what really took place. And of course, George Wallace, uh, on his dying bed, uh, apologized uh, to, the, to the country and the world for saying segregation now, segregation uh, tomorrow, segregation forever. Right. So I think that that dynamic in the civil rights movement worked. Uh, unfortunately, Bob, is that too much of what we happened in, in the reformation of white Democratic governors in the South uh, is now, now a days called the Republican Party of the South. Well, you're probably right. Uh, tell me, was Dr. King ever concerned about the FBI and the government's 
continual. You know, it's, I'm glad you. I know what you're going to say. No, he said, you know, as long as they're around, I'm protected. <laughs> uh, and I mean, that that King used to see the FBI. Is you know, I mean, and, and you know, people who say, well, you got all these tapes on him with women and all this other kind of stuff. Dr. King knew that his phones were being bugged. Dr. King knew that his mail was being checked. Dr. King knew that they were outside his house. Dr. King knew, uh, and, and he actually saw that as not as a fear, because you know he, he kept saying, well, you know, we're just trying to do right. He kept saying that, you know, that with them there, that will keep some of the racists and segregationists away from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazingly enough. <laughs> well, Tom, I know you've been asked this question hundreds of times, but I must ask it for the sake of keeping our interview authentic. Absolutely. Was Dr. King the ladies' man he's been accused of being? No more or less than you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> then I guess the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> What's that old saying? Those who know don't say, and those who say don't, don't know. know. <laughs> All right. Well, you understand I had to ask you that question. Uh, let's talk. Well, I had more. to respond that you way. You did. Yeah. You gave a very good response. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, your role with the SCLC. Uh, tell us about some of the activities that you were involved in uh, during that period. Well, I helped do a lot of different things with SCLC. I, um, I was in Birmingham, Alabama in 1966 when we went back to make sure that after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, a lot of places still didn't want to register black voters. And they wouldn't add additional voter registrars, they wouldn't add additional days or hours, and there were thousands of black people all across the South that wanted to register to vote. This was going to be their first time to register to vote. So what we had to do is we had to keep up the vigilance of, 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 of making sure that these cities and towns would register people to vote. Well, Birmingham, which shouldn't be a surprise to many people, continued its policies of, uh, of basically allowing black voters, okay, or black potential voters, only in on three days of the week, two hours a day. This is a year after the Voting Rights Act was passed. So we went back to Birmingham in 1966, and my job was to organize and help develop demonstrations with Hosea and with a number of other people, Stoney Cooks who worked in SCLC in those days, Andy would come over and Dr. King came back to Birmingham and Shuttlesworth and other people and Reverend Gardner. Um, and so I, my job was to get these high school students from Parker High School to the demonstration downtown to block the intersection at five o'clock. In those days in Birmingham, they didn't have expressways. They used to have free viaducts that led across to the suburbs and these other places and I went to Parker High School and my job was to get these kids out to march in the demonstrations and I broke the uh, lock that had put together this fence in the back and the Birmingham police and the notorious police wagon saw me doing this and here's a white guy at a black high school doing this you know and I my job was to get them out of there okay well in the process they found me later in the day and arrested me and put me in jail, charging me with disturbing the peace, resisting arrest, assaulting an officer, and threw, threw the book at me. It was much more dangerous for me. I went to jail probably 18, 20 times in the Civil Rights Movement, but it was always more dangerous for me to be put in jail for my own life because I was a white guy and I wasn't put in jail with the brothers. I was put in jail with white folks. Those same white folks out there couldn't stand seeing white nigger lover, uh, you know, come into their town. And it wasn't nice. It wasn't pretty. But after Birmingham, after this instance, it was a very bad instance that occurred there. I was in jail for almost 30 hours. Jose and I filed suit against Birmingham, Jefferson County, and the laws to desegregate the jails. Uh, and that lawsuit wound its way through the state courts in Alabama. Of course, they rejected the notion of desegregation of the jail. Went to the federal court uh, and, and Frank Johnson's uh, in, in Montgomery, who favored us. But the Alabama Attorney General tried to overturn that, went all the way to the Supreme Court. So, one of the most famous cases that I was involved in was Houck and Williams v. Birmingham, Jefferson County to desegregate the jails and went all the way to the Supreme Court, which made it happen. And you won. We won. Right. Who was your attorney? 
Well, two attorneys, Howard Moore, who represented uh, Julian Bond's brother-in-law, yeah. and Charles Morgan Jr., who was uh, just recently passed away uh, after a very good friend of uh, both of ours for years. Right. Chuck was a great man. He was a great man. Tell us a little bit about Chuck. Chuck was a, a man of great courage, born in Birmingham and uh, became a, a, a fierce advocate for uh, civil liberties and uh, became a, he was a wealthy lawyer actually when he was in Birmingham and came from a wealthy family in Birmingham. Uh, and he uh, spoke out loudly and very affirmatively in Birmingham after Dr. King wrote his letter and after the demonstrations uh, happened in, in Birmingham, after the, the kids were, um, uh, part of the demonstrations out there that where the kids were fire hosed and, and, uh, and they were, uh, um, brutalized very badly. And got, he came out and basically wrote his own letter to his Birmingham fellow white citizens. And they said, they gave him a resounding, uh, get the hell out of town. Ultimately winding up in Atlanta where he became the regional director of the, uh, of the ACLU and heading up the ACLU Voting Rights Project in the South. Went on to represent a number of people. One of his most famous cases I would imagine would be Muhammad Ali. And uh, he was successful in representing Muhammad Ali, the champ. Uh, went on to Washington uh, to live and, uh, and died in Destin, Florida not too long ago. Right. Great champion of civil liberties. I, I want to ask you this question now. And a good friend, by the way, of, of, of our old friend, uh, Zell Miller. Is he your old friend? Does that mean you're no longer his friend? Old friend. <laughs> I'm just putting that in quote. Uh, Miller will always be my friend. You you helped introduce me to Miller. I mean, Miller goes back in, in, in civil rights history as well. Uh, you know, Miller worked uh, with uh, Bob and uh, Lester Maddox. And between 1968 and 1974, there was a dramatic 380, well, not 380, 350 in Miller's political philosophy. And it was one that changed the political face of Georgia politics until Sonny Perdue was elected the first Republican. And Miller, Miller was very instrumental in making that happen by putting together a coalition in this state of black, women, black folks, women, we came up for the Equal Rights Amendment. That's a, that was a very radical thing to do back in the 1970s. And put together a coalition of black folks, low-income white folks, mountain folks, folks from down South Georgia, below the Nat Line, and, 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 and women. And he beat a woman and he beat Max Cleland, who was a war hero at that point, a triple amputee coming back here running for politics for the first time. And we were successful in making Miller lieutenant governor. The only time I've ever worked in government in my life was working three months after Miller got elected in 1975 and it convinced me that I never wanted to do it again. <laughs> Why? Miller! <laughs> Even though he, he, he was on the same page, uh, it was a tornado that took place here. It hit the governor's mansion. And uh, I was down at the Capitol. It was about 7 o'clock in the morning. And I commandeered the state helicopter. <laughs> Do you remember this? And uh, I was giving radio reports to uh, WSB and WGST and WP. In those days, there were a lot more news stations around town. And Miller heard me on the radio and said, what the hell are you doing up there? <laughs> well, how'd you get there? How'd you get there? And he took me in. I mean, he didn't speak to me for three days. Didn't fire me, but didn't speak to me for three days. Well, my question was, <laughs> uh, if Dr. King had not become the voice of the civil rights movement. I wouldn't be here. Who would have? All right. uh, I, that'd be a hard question to answer. Um, I doubt you and I would be sitting here talking today had Dr. King not become that leader of the civil rights movement because what that did, that made Atlanta the center of the civil rights movement and, and what, what changed so much so because of King. I mean, King was obviously not the only person, okay? You, I mean, you, there were a lot of people that were out there, but he was the leader of a ma massive movement from 1955 until his assassination in 1968. Um, Atlanta. Uh, became uh, ground zero for that movement. Uh, had 
had not been for Dr. King, SNCC probably would never been founded. SNCC actually was founded under SCLC's auspices. Mm -hmm. But had Dr. King not been um, uh, from Atlanta and had not led the movement from Atlanta, based in Atlanta, Andy Young wouldn't be here. Uh, you, Tom Houck wouldn't be here. Uh, Joe Lowry wouldn't be here. Uh, we go on. We didn't be no Jose feed, feed the hungry because Jose Williams wouldn't be here. I mean, John Lewis wouldn't be here. Julian Bond probably would be here because he was an academic. Uh, but uh, he probably wouldn't be the president of the NAACP, the chairman of the NAACP today. So much happened because King was where he was, and and that movement he led, and it changed. The whole equation of the city of Atlanta, to bring Maynard Jackson back from selling encyclopedias to running for mayor, uh, to uh, you know, to the succession of him and Andy Young and the, the young Bill Campbells of the world from Raleigh that wanted to come to Atlanta, to Shirley Franklin that left Washington D.C. to come to Atlanta. Atlanta became a magnet for for young black thoughts and minds. Let's go to 1973, the year that the that the city charter was changed. There was an election and it was the first time that black Atlanta had an opportunity to elect its public official. Uh, do you remember that year? I sure do. Tell As a matter of fact, I had just come back from registering 18 year olds to vote and I decided that I was, gonna, I was heady enough after seven million, several million dollars and heading up a staff of about 100 people around the country to register 18 year olds to vote, only to vote. In, 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 in minor numbers and in, in, in seeing uh, Richard Nixon uh, pull off a, uh, a 49 state sweep over George McGovern. Uh, and uh, I had just come back to Atlanta and I ran for the Board of Aldermen in pretty much an all white district uh, here in Atlanta. But I remember then when Maynard Jackson decided that he was going to challenge Sam Massell. Sam Massell himself in 1969 after Ivan Allen it was very split because a lot of white people that supported uh, Sam Massell, I mean uh, supported Ivan Allen, were more of the blue blood north side type and were not mm -hmm. Sam Massell. Sam Massell was, a, was Atlanta's first Jewish mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what happened was Massell came into power and probably made a few missteps along the way, including elect the police chief, John Inman, uh, and it created quite a controversy in town and pushed Maynard Jackson into the race. Mm -hmm. Maynard Jackson had been vice mayor uh, mm -hmm. under um, Ivan Allen, I mean under uh, Sam Massell. It was very heady time. Maynard uh, Holbrook Jackson was a very, um, uh, a very strong figure, a very, when he would walk in a room, people would turn around and take a look at him, not just because he was 325 <laughs> pounds and six feet three, but because he had that he had that charisma, and he put together the first major organization. Now Leroy Johnson had been elected prior to that, and uh, Q. V. Williamson was on the board of aldermen here, the old board of aldermen. But this was the first time that you were going to see substantive change in black, black political power flex its muscle, and it wasn't a very good campaign. It was, a, I mean, it was a very hard fought campaign. In the end, Sam Massell was running ads, which I think he regrets to this day, about Atlanta being a city. Um, too young to die, and having tumbleweed go down Peachtree Street in his ads. Mm -hmm. But the city council was elected uh, that year also, and there were, as I recall, the, except for Q. V. Williamson, the first black members in many, many years. There were several black members elected that year, three or four. One including uh, a friend of ours, James George Bond. Uh, was elected. Julian Bond's brother was elected. And there was three others that elected. Jim Maddox, who's re retiring now after all those years, was elected to mm -hmm. city council that year. And it, and there was a a, a new, uh, uh, if you will, a a, a changing face in of, of city hall. Not just because there were black folks now uh, holding city elected in seats, but because there was a a a feeling that for the first time. Uh, there was going to be uh, affirmative action, and there'd be, and it, it City Hall would be a place where black folks would be welcome. Mm -hmm. well, you've been an insider with every Atlanta mayor since Maynard uh, in 1974. If you will, give us a thumbnail sketch of each of them and what you think they accomplished. 
Well, I think Maynard, obviously, uh, as, the, as the first black mayor of Atlanta, uh, was the person that really set in motion uh, a, a mechanism and a machinery for, to help other blacks get elected and also to, in many ways, show that a black could be mayor. He had a, a, a tumultuous relationship with the business community, but he was proven correct when he said he was going to build a new airport under budget uh, and on time. So his successes were in the economic development area and in jobs in Atlanta and making, and in many ways, making folks who had felt left out and left behind in government feel a part of government. Then Andy Young came in after Maynard had really plowed a whole new um, area of, uh, of political uh, um, change here. And Andy really came to a position where he put Atlanta on the map internationally. Delta started to fly more internationally during that time. Andy had a good relationship with the, uh, uh, Maynard did not have a really great relationship with the media, uh, and but Andy did. I think when Andy came in, one of the first things he ever said was, um, you know, you can fight with the media, you can fight with the Constitution and the Journal, you know, uh, he said, you can, you know, you're not gonna get anywhere. They buy ink by the barrel. And that was his philosophy. Uh, you know, so he, and he kind of got along with everybody. And Shirley Franklin, who was, is now the current day mayor, mayor, really in many ways, ran the city under Andy. Uh, she was in charge uh, of things here, and Andy traveled quite a bit. But if it hadn't been for Andy Young, in 1996, we would not have had an Olympic game. Uh, so the Olympics, really, in terms of legacy, and putting Atlanta into the international mode, where it was Andy's legacy. Now, after Andy was elected two terms, Maynard came back. Maynard came back, and I think Maynard wishes now, I mean, I think people think, wish now that Maynard didn't come back, because he really didn't move in that second, we call it Maynard one, Maynard two, that second term, and he decided he wasn't gonna run again, but he anointed a young city council member, who was his floor leader, William Craig Campbell. And Bill uh, decided that he was gonna have different kinds of, uh, uh, of, of legacies. Unfortunately, one of his legacies, he went to jail. But uh, what he, I think that people would see in now in Atlanta is that Atlantic Station wouldn't be here today hadn't been built for Bill Campbell. Uh, you wouldn't have had a lot of the development in downtown. He set, the, uh, he set in motion the kinds of things that now have brought 100,000 new people into Atlanta in the last nine years. He also hired a woman named Renee Glover to head up the Atlanta Housing Th Authority which has become a model in the country in terms of, uh, of bringing together mixed income groups and tearing down uh, the housing projects that used to be a place of last resort to becoming a place where recidivism and crime was breeding. And then Shirley Franklin came in after Bill Campbell uh, and for eight years now Shirley's been mayor. She says that she's not worried about her legacy so I guess I shouldn't be. Um, but uh, I, I think that if you want to take a look at Shirley's legacy, she'll call it, she, she has been the brick by brick mayor. She has been the sore mayor. She has been the person that has helped put the infrastructure back into place. But she's also been the mayor in many ways, okay, that has found in the last two or three years crime, whether it's for real or not, becoming more violent in the city and unfortunately for her, the economic crisis in the country has brought about police furloughs and and um, and a lot of firing of city employees. I think Shirley will probably come away looking pretty good after eight years. You got to mention that one more time that you're in the historic Manuel's Tavern, <laughs> okay. a place that you know that. Uh, Zell Miller, Jimmy Carter, uh, you know, I mean, great Georgia politicians, Republicans and Democrats. Sonny Purdue comes for lunch here, okay? Uh, and, that, you know, I mean, really, it, this is an institution. It is. Very historical place. Manuel was a very historical person. He was. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us about Manuel Malou? I will. Let me, I should move this glass from. Well, there we, there we go. That's okay. Eddie Maloof, uh, he, he grew up in Atlanta. He grew up in, in a, uh, uh, a section of Atlanta right now, not too far from it. 
Turner Field uh, in a neighborhood that was the ethnic part of Atlanta, where the Lebanese and Jews and Greeks lived next door to each other in Atlanta. And uh, back in 1956, he, he opened up a 12 to 15 stool bar that just sold beer, and uh, which was a dry cleaning store prior to that, and called it Manuals. And he always had a love for politics, and being a, a Lebanese, had a, a desire to, uh, you know, make it over here in the new country. And he uh, he became very early on involved in the political situation in Atlanta. I didn't meet him until 1967. People told me that this guy voluntarily integrated integrated the. Uh, the bars in Atlanta before other bars were integrated here, and that this was a place that the political figures in Atlanta came to. And so in 19, 1967, when I met him, he was a, um, he was a, uh, as I put that on the other side over there, Emmanuel had already well established himself here as the Carl Sanders uh, would come through here, Jimmy Carter would come through here, uh, Bob Short would come through here. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, in those days, he just still served beer. But he became a rational political force uh, in, in Atlanta. People would come to manuals, particularly journalists. And so this became the media hangout. So this became the media and the political hangout. So you'd have all of the folks that, you know, uh, you know, took their notepads and they would come here. Paul Hemphill was a well-known columnist here in Atlanta came here. And so manuals became the place to be uh, in the late 60s and has held on to a position for more than 40 years as if you're going to get elected in Atlanta, you've got to come through manuals and either have a party here, shake hands here, or be seen here in the old days drinking beer, but in these days, I guess, even having a nice tea. Uh, and and Manuel was went on to become an elected official himself. He became chairman of the DeKalb County Commission. And was always perceived as being a very frugal man. I don't think anybody ever got a free beer off him here. Uh, somebody that was always willing to, in his own way, uh, give his opinion. And you may have disagreed with his opinion, and oftentimes if you disagreed with his position, you say, get the hell out of here. Uh, but uh, by, by and large, by and large, you know, he was a man bigger than life. And his name will live on, They've, you know, not more than just in DeKalb County, but uh, as a political institution in the city. Uh, you mentioned that you campaigned for Zell Miller in 1974 for lieutenant governor. In 1990, when he ran for governor, one of his opponents was Andrew Young. Who are you for? You know, that's a very interesting thing. Jimmy Carter probably wouldn't be elected today had Andy Young and Zell Miller not run against each other. Uh, and I was on the radio, luckily, in those days, and I, I did the, one of the debates, actually, in 1990 uh, between Andy and Zell. Uh, I think it was on Channel 5 here. Um, I, um, I had encouraged Andy to run, not thinking Zell was going to run. Uh, and when they both ran against each other, I was, unfortunately, in a position of being on the radio. But I, I guess you would have to say that I supported Andy. But uh, I would put it to you this way. It was a civil campaign, and it was a good campaign. Miller had two interesting people running his campaign that went on to great fame, James Carville and Paul Begala. Miller, I mean, uh, Miller had them on his side. Andy had, on his side, George Stephanopoulos, uh, Frank Greer, Mandy Grunewald went on to the White House, and the chief of staff now in the United States for the United States president for, for, for Obama, Rabbi Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel used to go to Andy every day and get him to make phone calls to raise funds. Andy Rahm became the, the, the fundraiser. Well, all these folks that ran Miller's campaign and ran Young's campaign came together to elect Jimmy Carter president in 1992. So if it hadn't been for an Andy Young, uh, and I think it was Andy Young who, in, I mean, it was Zell Miller who introduced Carville mm -hmm. to uh, Bill Clinton. Yes. And, 
And I can remember the day after uh, Miller was elected, that uh, uh, that day he invited us all to come by, and Carville explained how the whole thing unraveled and said how what a gentleman Andrew Young had been in his graceful endorsement of Miller and campaigning for Miller for the, uh, uh, the election in 1990 after he had lost. Two of your good friends are good friends of mine, uh, John Lewis and Julian Bond. You were very close to both of them. Tell us a little about each. Well, Mr. Lewis is a old and dear friend. Well, I actually met in Cambridge, Maryland when I was 15 years old. Uh, and he was chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, he's a very serious man. He's a man of great integrity. He's a man that believes firmly that the American dream still must live on, that um, you, know, you must keep your eyes on the prize, and that uh, he has become an icon. Uh, Time Magazine one time called him a living saint. Well, Mr. Lewis isn't quite a living saint as much in, as a friend as he is to the nation, but he is a, he's, a, he's a man of integrity. He's a man of great honesty and compassion. Compassion. Uh, you know, he believes, truly believes, uh, in a beloved community at peace with itself. And he has taken that throughout his entire life. Probably there wasn't any major figure in the civil rights movement that hadn't been, uh, had, had been as a, many times to jail or beaten as, as, as John Lewis. Julian Bond, on the other hand, well, besides having James as his brother, he's a pretty decent guy. Um, <laughs> And it, I mean, Jane. Jane is uh, is wonderful. Is Jane Moore, uh, and he, wonderful family. His father, great uh, academic academic man, and his mother, a wonderful literary person, and a sweetheart. Uh, but Julian, everybody in Atlanta thought after Julian was elected in a kind of disputed election in 1966 that they thought Julian Bond would be the congressman from. Uh, Atlanta, the first black congressman from Atlanta. Well, as we know, it became Andrew Young. But when Andrew Young became ambassador to the UN, and it wound up being an election between John Lewis and, and Julian Bond, uh, which luckily again, I was uh, doing talk radio, so I had to keep a fairly neutral position in that whole thing, although uh, Lillian Lewis and John Lewis didn't think so. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I wound up not actually talking with John for about a year after the election, uh, and, and really maybe longer. Um, but um, I, um, I, think Julian, I think Julian was, in many ways, uh, the, he'd be the intellectual side of the political equation. He would have been a great congressman. There's no question about it. John is too, but I mean, I think Julian would have been a great congressman. As chance has it, you know, he went on to Washington. He had a, you know, he ran, as you well know, he, he, he ran for president and, and, and lost in the primary, but he, he, he ran, he was, he was nominated for vice president and was too young uh, in Chicago in 1968. Um, he is a person of um, words. He's a wordsmith, whereas John is a man of emotion. Julian's a wordsmith man. And he went on. Now, after his, after his life in Georgia, he went on to become chairman of the NAACP, a position he still holds. Mm -hmm. Let's get back for just a minute to the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, after the death of Dr. King and the passage of uh, several Supreme Court decisions against segregation and the passage of the Civil Rights and Votings Act, uh, has the movement been pronounced dead? No. And I want to go back to something quickly here in terms of talking about the South. You asked earlier a question about how Dr. King or others perceived white politicians in the South. And who, and I, I mentioned Ivan Allen and, and uh, um, um, Charlie Weltner as an example of where the white. If it hadn't been for white 
male judges in the South between 1955 and, and 1968, uh, the movement would have been dead at its heels. I mean, basically, it was a lot from the great, from the Tuttles and the Edenfields to the, uh, you know, the, the white judges of the South uh, in that period of time from the 50s through the 90s uh, were real heroes in this country. And many of them appointed, by the way, by Eisenhower, mm -hmm. uh, which was a, a Republican president. But uh, going back to what, what, you, what you, were, you were saying uh, about um, what was that question again? <laughs> it was you were asking whether or not the movement is dead. dead. Well, the movement is we. Yeah, I mean, obviously. I mean, there's no. You know, you're not going to. You know, as much as people want to get people marching again, and getting people out in the streets again. You know, I mean, and as you know, I mean, uh, the tea baggers have it these days. I mean, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a movement. Uh, you know, that continues to exist. You know, the dream lives on and, and, and will never die. Uh, it just did different tactics in different times. Marches were right. Marches were absolutely correct in the 50s and 60s in this country. They brought about the change. Mm -hmm. Nonviolence was right as a tactic in those days. It brought about the change. Today, there's different kinds of techniques and tactics. I mean, it, it's, it's not, you're not organizing like labor had to do in the, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and the picket line is not the same thing today as it was many years ago. So a civil rights movement per se, um, a new generation is coming along. Uh, and in many ways that, that new generation is gonna lead us into a, a different kind of movement than we have today. The election last year of Barack Obama uh, in many ways is that new direction. And Dr. I mean, unfortunately, in the South, uh, you know, only 10 to 15 percent of whites voted for, for Obama. Mm -hmm. But around the rest of the country, and the overall vote was very encouraging because you had more than 40 percent of whites in America to vote for a black man for president, one with the name of Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, so, I mean, there are many differences that are taking place in, in, in terms of the movement of the country. We have a hell of a lot of work to do in the South, though, Bob. Uh, and I don't, I don't think it's a, it's a movement that uh, can be brought about uh, by mass demonstrations or boycotts or those kinds of things anymore. It has to take place in a change of heart. And that change of heart uh, is, is still uh, very difficult to come by in terms of many white politicians. And as I said earlier, you know, the, 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 those courageous Democrats of, in this country in the 60s and early 70s, uh, many of them have have um, uh, have died, have uh, grayed, have frayed, or or moved on. Uh, and I, I want to see a new breed of those folks that can come out there and can give leadership. Do you think there's anybody out there who could fill Dr. King's shoes? By the way, I want to say this too: two white Southerners are the only two Democrats we had as president before we had a black African American president. Okay, now, can you answer my question? Can you see anyone out there who could fill Dr. King's shoes? You know, I'm sure there will be someday, but probably not in my lifetime. I think Barack Obama to many today is uh, uh, what, what King was to many people of his era, particularly young blacks and young whites as well, uh, which I, I think young whites and young blacks across the country see the hope and, and, the, and, and the dream in, in, in Barack Obama that they saw in the days of Martin Luther King. Was my excitement level as high on Barack Obama being elected president of the United States as it was working for Dr. King and driving him around, listening to his speeches and his sermons? No, I wasn't. But I'm saying that today there are uh, uh, many, many people around this country uh, and around the world that take new hope and inspiration in Barack Obama. So, I mean, you know, but there's a different kind of leadership. Uh, uh, it's a different kind of time. It's a different kind of movement mm -hmm. than it was back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Will we have another Herman Talmadge in Georgia? I don't think so. I don't think that Johnny Isaacson or, uh, or uh, what's his name, Chambliss, uh, can possibly, you know, kind of, you know, tie the shoes of a Herman Talmadge. Herman Talmadge may have been a racist and segregationist, but he was the father of the food stamps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, it was little things like that 
that, you know, what these Southern politicians did in their own ways, in their own days. Let's talk a minute about uh, the assassination of Dr. King and his funeral in Atlanta. Where, where were you when that happened? I was actually in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, I had been in Memphis on April 1st, and uh, Dr. King had then announced that he was going back to Atlanta and then coming back to Memphis um, to speak and to lead this rally and demonstration. And I, my job was in the Poor People's Campaign, was to, which we were organizing. We, Memphis was in the middle of, uh, and it was really a diversion in the Poor People's Campaign. We weren't scheduled to go to Memphis. The sanitation workers went on strike. They were broke out there. Labor, which was very much a part of the civil rights movement and very much a part of Resurrection City and the March on Washington, the Poor People's March on Washington, really pushed Dr. King to go to Memphis against the wishes of many people, including Andy Young. But what happened was, uh, I was in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, with a guy named Ernie Austin, who was from, was from Kentucky. And what we did was, uh, we were organized, and we were speaking to the Tennessee Council on Human Relations, actually of the night of the fourth, to try to get them to get poor white folks involved in the Poor People's Campaign. My job was not, what we were trying to do was bring together Hispanics, bring together Native Americans, bring together poor white folks, all to march together in Washington with black folks. The real first real rainbow coalition. So my job was up there was to talk to the folks and I was coming, going to the meeting at six o'clock in, in Knoxville, I can remember it to this day, and I heard the kid yell out in the street, Martin Luther King's been shot, Martin Luther King's been shot. And I said, I hope that this kid's, you know, is not, he's gonna cause some trouble here in the streets saying that kind of stuff. And I get to the church and find out that indeed Dr. King had been shot. And I had called the house and I got Miss Lockhart, who was the housekeeper on the telephone. And she told me that Coretta was getting ready to go to the airport, uh, that Mayor uh, Ivan Allen was coming to the house and picking her up and taking her to the airport. And she said, I said, well, she said, do you think I should come back? And she said, yes. We well, made several other calls and then Ernie and Austin and I came back to Atlanta. We found out shortly after that Dr. King had, had passed. And, for the next 48 hours, essentially, I didn't get any sleep at all. Came back and helped organize the transportation for the funeral. Mm -hmm. But the mood in Atlanta was very interesting. While there were riots all over the country, Atlanta was relatively calm. Uh, and it was an airy calm. Um, as you recall, um, the day of the funeral, probably one of the biggest overreactions that Lester Maddox ever had in his, his, uh, his political career was ringing the state capitol with, uh, with, with state troopers, mm -hmm. which was certainly not necessary. It was a uh, overkill. Mm -hmm. The city of Atlanta remained peaceful for those six days between Dr. Mm -hmm. King's assassination and that funeral. In the mood of this town, black and white, Southerners and non-Southerners and people that flocked here was to be as helpful as they possibly could be in giving a send-off for King. Mm -hmm. Well, after your uh, civil rights days, you became a talking head on the radio. Yeah. How did you ever come to that decision? Naturally, you know. I mean, I mean, I was vaccinated uh, with, uh, you know, a microphone. Um, and uh, no, I mean, really, I, I, I think what happened was the first time I really became interested in doing talk. I used to, as a kid, I'd pretend I was doing the Tonight Show under my blankets and doing, a, you know, I mean, is an eight, eight, nine year old kid. Uh, I mean, I always wanted to get in radio. I always wanted to be part of radio. And I was started writing a column for the Atlanta, for Atlanta Magazine and for the Atlanta Gazette called The Tattler. Uh, and The Tattler sort of was a political column and is also kind of like a gossip column. And this is back in 1976-77. And I uh, was at a basketball game, a Hawks basketball game, a guy named Mike Wheeler, who went on to be one of the founders of HBO, uh, he was head of GST at the time, WGST Radio, and he asked me if I would put that uh, tattler on the radio every morning, and uh, you know, I said I'd love to do it. And so he asked me to come on. So I started doing commentaries for GST, '77, and uh, that led to a talk show. Uh, part of it. He, hosted by me and another part of it hosted by me and Dick Williams, who's a well-known star, and another part of it brought Neil Bortz back into the business, and he was my counterpoint for about three or four months 
it was either he was going to kill me or I was going to kill him. Uh, and uh, but Bortz was uh, part of, of of the show. I actually brought him back to radio. You know, if he if he sees his interview, Bortz needs to give me part of his salary for life. Um, and uh, but at any rate, uh, that's how I got into it. And then it evolved really big time in 1981 when Maynard Jackson uh, was mayor, uh, and um, there was uh, the missing and murdered children. Uh, of Atlanta, a terrible tragedy here where weeks and weeks went by and there was many children that were killed. And uh, I did a nightly show, which was sort of like before Nightline. Uh, and that's when I got really into talk radio big time. It hit, everybody in town had to listen to this. As a matter of fact, I think Wayne Williams, who was the accused killer and the convicted killer of uh, a couple of these kids, uh, his, his parents were uh, slapped with an injunction for calling my radio show. So I became big time during that period. Uh, and then you were on television. Well, about that same time, uh, over at Channel 2, uh, Andy Fisher, who was the then news director at Channel 2, uh, WSB-TV, thought he put together a little talking head show on Sunday called Sunday News Conference. So he put together me, Dick Williams, uh, a fellow named Bill Shipp, uh, and Rick Allen, uh, and we were hosted at that point by a, uh, a, a, a preacher, Ron Saylor. He was a black commentator over there. Uh, we continued over there at Channel 2 for several years until a, a conflict arose between an uh, opinionated news political reporter, Bill Nygut, and Ron Saylor. And that's when we moved our show to Channel 36. But it became kind of like the Sunday morning thing to do would be like to listen to Tom Houck and Dick Williams go at each other and, and Bill <laughs> Shipp try to uh, sort of moderate it, Rick, Rick Allen being sort of uh, uh, the, the more moderate person over there. But we had great fun doing it. I did it for 20 years. 20 years. Left in 2001. Mm -hmm. You aren't doing any of that anymore. Every once in a while. Every once in a while, I'll do something on CNN, I'll do something on uh, MSNBC or something, but not, not on a regular basis. I'm writing my book. Tell us about your book. Book is what, a lot of what we talked about right here, and I hope that uh, it will be out within the next couple of years. Uh, I, I ran into Doug Blackman the other day, who's a, the Wall Street Journal bureau chief here. And he's written a Pulitzer Prize winning book called uh, Slavery by Another Name. So I said, Doug, how long did it take you to write your book? He said, seven years. I said, well, I've got three more years to go. Maybe, I'll, uh, But I hope to have it out in the next couple of years. And it basically travels that, me that memoir route, how that little you know, scrappy kid from uh, Boston wound up in the household of the kings and what all happened and occurred during that time with great insights that I don't think other people have ever written about regarding the King family and the civil rights movement. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm anxious to read it. Uh, you've always been a loyal Democrat. What has happened to the Democratic Party in Georgia? Well, I could say two words, Bobby Kahn, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> 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 I guess that, don't use that. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, but, uh, well, I think a lot of things has happened. Ha has happened. I, think that, I think that the parties uh, had its problem with the National Party. I think that you know, leaders like Zell Miller have uh, become, uh, have gone from being liberal to moderate to conservative, and that's happened with a number of other people in the state. Miller, I guess, right now has made full circle. He started off as a conservative, then he went to a liberal, then he went to a moderate, and then he went back down to a conservative. So he's made f a complete switch. So I mean, a lot of those guys out there, like Miller, uh, you know, have become Republicans. And um, the General Assembly and the, and the um, and the governor's office, well, the governor's office for the first time went, uh, as you well know, seven years ago to a Republican. Uh, there was not a Tom Murphy. Uh, that can um, bring together the, the various forces. And he actually gerrymandered himself out of uh, being reelected many years ago. I mean, that was the kind of guy he was, but Murphy was able to bring the rural and urban folks together. 
And the Democratic Party in the state of Georgia, even after the civil rights bills, was more of a club than a philosophy. Uh, and so as a club, they could organize under the name Democrat, but it didn't have to keep one specific philosophy. So they didn't have to be in the National Party. So we continued to elect Democrats to president, Democrats to the Senate. And then I think probably uh, it really came down when the, the national movements in this country, uh, um, abortion and, and a lot of the far right wing causes finally crept in. And those people that called themselves Democrats really aligned themselves closer to the Republican National Party. Mm -hmm. And that's how we lost a lot of that, I think. But I blame Bobby Kahn for losing that election to a, uh, I think Roy Barnes could have beat um, Sonny Perdue eight years ago had, uh, had Bobby Kahn not been the uh, campaign manager. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't mind saying that either, by the way. And I think if Bobby Kahn is in the race this year, okay, with Roy Barnes, I think Roy might could not have defeat again. I think this guy's a loser. <laughs> well, if you had the power, Tom, how would you fix these problems? Make sure Bobby Kahn doesn't get involved. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, would you... how would I fix these problems? I would, I, would, I would fix these problems uh, in, in many ways. I, I would campaign like Roy Barnes is beginning to campaign. I would try to bring together around common purpose and common goals some of the things that Barnes is talking about uh, in terms of, uh, of, ec of education, in terms of dealing with resources and, and water, in terms of dealing with the, the, the non-controversial big issues that affect us on an everyday basis, the economy, jobs, mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things, education. I think that that's one of the first things you have to do. Then I think that what you have to take a look at is that race is still a fact. And it's, it, it, it divides too many people in the state. But the state is changing. I mean, it's changing dramatically. Uh, the Hispanic that lives in Gwinnett County or lives in Cherokee County or lives in Spalding County or Paulding County or lives down up in Hall County or those lives up in Dalton, Georgia, those folks aren't voting, but their kids will. Mm -hmm. And when that happens within 10 years, we, we can begin to see a new dynamic in this state, a larger Hispanic vote coming together with the black vote and the progressive white vote, which I think is the future of the Democratic Party in this state. I think there will be sufficient numbers then to be able to turn back uh, the, uh, the red tide in Georgia. Uh, so I think that we, we may not be able to turn it around in the next four, eight years, but I think that there's gonna be a, a new coalition of Democrats here within the near future that's gonna su substantially change the, uh, the uh, I, think we'll see, I think we'll see more Democrats elected after this next census than we have right now. I think, that, I think the Democratic Party it needs, it needs a, a vibrant leader at the top, not the Blast Jane kid, who's a, who, I, who I like and respect very much from Athens. I mean, she's a, a good lady. But we don't have the dynamism. We don't have to, you know, the, we don't have the, the force out there of somebody that can really bring people together. And, I, and, we, and we lost eight years of organization because when Bobby Kahn was executive director of the Democratic Party of Georgia, what he did was not organize those house districts and those house seats out there. All he did was try to organize against um, uh, uh, Sonny Perdue. So we lost house seats. We lost Senate seats. We didn't have any organization out there and we had no funds out there. So you have to get the funding together, and you need to get the organization together, and I think we need to come up with a dynamic leader. If Roy Barnes is elected uh, governor next year, I think the Democratic Party will be well on its way to uh, getting its house back in order. It's been said that the Republicans defeat the Democrats in Georgia because they have what they call a better bench, <laughs> which means that they train their candidates. They carefully select their candidates. Well, you think John Linder's a good bench? I can't pass judgment. Do you, do you, do you think that, that Dr. Price is a good bench? I can't. Do you think pass Phil judgment. Dingery is a good bench? You, you know, I'm like you in that Miller, uh, Young <laughs> race, and that Bond, uh, uh, John Lewis race. I I plead. I, I'm what Marvin Griffin would call a twinsy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they've got a good bench. I think it's what they have, okay, what they've been having is uh, they, they, they've, they, they've, with Ralph Reed and other, you know, Ralph Reed lost his election here. Uh, that, that philosophy, okay, 
that was originated back in uh, under Richard Nixon back over there by my old friend Lee Atwater in South Carolina has, has, has really r ruled the South for the last 40 years. And I think that what Lyndon Johnson said to Richard Russell was correct. That after he came out and, and, and voted for the Voting Rights Act and voted for the Civil Rights Bill of 64 and 65, he told Richard Russell, we've lost the next 50 years of Democrats. Yeah. But that 50 years is almost up. That's right. That's right. Well, Tom, you're certainly an interesting gentleman. I've enjoyed talking with you, but uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about? No, I think that James is hungry, and uh, that Harold, Harold over there is, uh, looks like he can eat, needs something. <laughs> Not really. I, w I, w I, w I, w I would like to say that I hope that whatever happens in the election in Atlanta in, in this year, okay, that, that, w that this city continue to grow and prosper, and I think it will. Uh, I, I think that you know, the talk of having a white woman elected mayor of Atlanta uh, is, is a possibility. I, I, don't, I don't put that aside. I think that we've come a long way, though, from 1973 to 2009. Uh, and if there is a white mayor this time, okay, in Atlanta, if it, in, in, which would turn the clock of history either back or forward, depending on what your viewpoint would be, I think that it would not be uh, the end all of the progressive uh, aspects of this city. I think that if even if you, even if Elisa Borders or a Kasim Reed gets elected, that it's time for the changing of the guard at City Hall, so to speak. And I think that no matter who's elected, that's what you have to look at. You have to look at a new Atlanta. 100,000 folks have moved here in the last five years. It's a lot of people coming to this town. And Atlanta has a lot of new young blood. We need to tap into that. Thank you, Tom Howe.